second section of spectacular evidence. So I'm going to introduce our next speaker performer, Dr. Michelle Williams Gamaka, visual artist and filmmaker. Current projects include The Fruit Is There To Be Eaten, Brown Queertopia, and the feature films The Imperial and Violet Colbo, featuring brown protagonists to address the historical sidelining of such characters. For over 11 years, with Mika Bao, Cinema Suitcase, she's completed several films and installations exploring migratory aesthetics, mental health, and gender ideology. Since 2009, with artist Julia Koneski, Michelle has explored the psychotherapeutic work of Lydia Clark. She completed a PhD in Fine Arts at Goldsmiths College in 2012, where she now works as a lecturer in BA Fine Arts. Lydia Clark's transformation in the mid-1970s from artist to practitioner of experimental psychotherapy cannot easily be compared with other artists. She began by devising a new role for the art spectator by instigating an active rather than passive subjectivity, passing her agency as artist to the spectator and encouraging them to take control of the creative process. Upon returning to Brazil from Paris in 1976, Clark established a therapeutic practice in Copacabana. There, her clients, mainly comprised of former art spectators and professional associates, undoubtedly familiar with her work, as well as prostitutes working in the area. There were also clients with neuroses and more serious psychotic disorders who attended individual treatments. Like all psychoanalysts, Clark underwent her own analysis with Pierre Fedida, who had been a student of Gilles Deleuze and was influenced by Jacques Lacan's work. Her writing references the work of Melanie Klein, D.W. Winnicott, and Wilfred Bion. Like these analysts, Clark helped her clients return from isolated, non-engaging states to a world in which they can utilize their creative capacity. Her sculptures left the pedestal and found new support in the hands of her participants. Personifying simplicity, they became little more than the material they comprised. Clark's objects were eradicating themselves as symbols of art by shifting to the experiential. Her works became acts in time through which she encouraged individuals to claim their lost capacities for creativity and play through the body and mind. These works can be seen as direct, a direct response to the context of Brazil, which underwent a long period of violent military dictatorship. Echoing the analytical encounter, but with the focus on physical articulation rather than verbal negotiation, Clark entered a reciprocal dialogue with those who participated in her therapy. In this role, Clark herself embodies the intervening substance of a medium, a go-between connecting the sentient subject with objects that enable the individual to tap into the personal and subjective bodily memory, what she termed memory of the body. Clark's therapy sessions were private encounters by this late stage of her work, she was keen to avoid the theatre of performance with its obligatory exhibitionism of the artist and the voyeurism of non-participating spectators. Yves Alain Bois writes, Clark's late practice engendered its own antidote, the creation of a sanctimonious atmosphere that was wholly contrary to her intent. It has prompted several critics to allude to Joseph Boyce whose cult she loathed. This contrary intention took the form of humble, aesthetically minimalist materials from everyday life. Plastic bags, netting, stones, rubber bands, shells, water, plastic tubing and string. 
participants responded to the tactile or living qualities of these materials, finding comparative, comparative associations to personal histories. Carlos Basualdo states that the relational objects were intended to produce, once applied periodically to the bodies of patients, a series of psychic changes. The physical sensation of relief, the sensation of blocks, in some a freeing, albeit temporary, of the habitual constrictions of their respective psychic structures. The concept started in 1966 with Pedra e Ar, Air and Stone, that incorporated the element of air into the form and function of the work. Participants were invited to squeeze a transparent inflated plastic bag that had a stone nestling on its upper surface. As they squeezed, they had to carefully manipulate the stone's movement. The indentation made the stone um, reveal both inside and outside <coughs> of the bag. Its expansion and contraction reminiscence of movements of a bodily organ. Clark described the sensation. I slowly started to squeeze the stone against the bag with my hands. With the pressure, the stone went up and went down, above the bag of air. Then I suddenly noticed that something was alive. It looked like a body. It was a body. In Respire Comigo, Breathe With Me, Clark heightens our awareness of the internal process of air within the body. A concertina tube connected in a loop is coaxed to expand and contract by the participant. The small gap in the tubing produces a sound similar to breathing. Through manipulation of these simple materials, objects begin to convey a duality between the interior and exterior qualities of their structure in relation to the interior and exterior structure of their bodies. Guy Brett, who experienced <coughs> many of Clark's propositions, describes placing respire comigo near to one's ear, as if one had put one's own lung inside oneself, or as if one conjured up another intimately close. <coughs> On the screen, you can see breathing propositions made by myself and American artist Julia Koneski, made simply with plastic bags and tubing. On the screen, they are carried out by the Goldsmith students in a Leisure Clark workshop that we conducted just this Sunday past. In their very ordinariness, the relational objects operate like a porous membrane between our associative connections and the materiality that sits within them. Art historian Susan Best suggests that they explicitly stimulate the sensory and affective recollections of the pre-verbal body. <coughs> British social anthropologist Tim Ingold proposes an animist reading of objects. If our agency can act upon things, the reverse could also be true if agency is imaginatively bestowed on things then they can start acting like people. They can act back, inducing persons in their vicinity to do and think what, the other, what otherwise they might not. In Nikki Glover's brilliant book, Psychoanalytic Aesthetics, she discusses that through psychoanalysis, a patient slowly evolves the capacity to make use of words for the understanding of emotional psychic space, which Bion implies are necessary in the process of transformation of non-sensuous intuition into sensuous realisation. According to Bion, the successful analyst becomes the container for the patient's content and also provides content for his container. Clark provided containers through these objects asking subjects to draw upon their multisensorial intuition to articulate often pre-verbal or non-verbalized physical sensations.
Clark treated her relational objects as bodily extensions, or even additional layers, like clothing, of the body. Once activated by the hands of participants, the materials, whether pulled together or in isolation, take on the status of a proxy that loosely relates to the structure of the human body. Netting functions as skin, tubing substitutes bodily pipes. Inflated plastic bags are akin to organs. Curator Felicity Lunn notes the recurring theme in Brazilian art of architectural sculptures as a body, a kind of sensory shelter, and to the human body as a house in which the senses play out complex relationships. Clark and her contemporary, Elio Oitisica, required participants to physically immerse themselves by entering the work. The link between the body and architecture is evidence in Clark's 1968 work, A Casa e o Corpo, The House is a Body, from her series Organic or Ephemeral Architectures. After removing their shoes, visitors move through a tunnel and enter a plastic structure with different compartments. Clark referred to as cells, corresponding, corresponding both to the smallest functional unit of the body and also a room that contains or imprisons the body. Each cell is filled with balloons. This was way before Martin Creed. Um, plastic bags and strips of thread and elastic that hit and cling to the face. <coughs> Susan Best, meanwhile, proposes that Clark began to use her objects to clothe, encase, or envelop the body as a new skin. But that the concept of home is conversely to be found in the spectator. The, pa the participant finds their home in the body, and to fully inhabit it, the new skin seems to use the body as a kind of medium or a resounding chamber for registering its presence and innovations. Despite the differences in terminology and subjects, Leisure Clark's work can be constructively <coughs> compared with D.W. Winnicott's um, practice, which actively encouraged physical interaction with objects. Both Clark and Winnicott make creativity a primary tool of their therapy through object relations. The role of play was key to Winnicott's work with children and mothers, suggesting that psychotherapy takes place in the overlap between two areas of playing, that of the patient and that of the therapist. He suggested that the role of the therapist to encourage a patient from a state of not being able to play into a state of being able to play was also something that Clark propagated as a space for participants to engage with art objects as a creative and playful process. There were no specific rules as to what could be defined as a relational object, but she suggests it is the relationship established with the fantasy of a subject that is defined. The same object may express different meanings for different subjects at different moments. In, the sense, in that sense, the subject lends meaning to it, losing the condition of a simple object in order to be impregnated, a being lived as a living part of the subject.
These images are from um, a recent exhibition at Anka Kultis Gallery, and you may recognise the image of the from the poster to spectacular evidence, um, which, to just give you a, a brief explanation, was very much to do with living out the research of Leisure Clark, but to do so by taking that sensorial leap that Clark proposed, to not just read about Clark's theory, but to actively engage in a, in a physical and sensuous leap into research. Clark's Baba, Antro Clark's Baba Anthropophagica, translated as cannibalistic jewel, is another example of a biological architecture for the body. In Baba, a figure lies recumbent on the floor with eyes closed. The corpo collettivo, what Clark named the collective body, encircles them. The other participants lean over their subject and begin pulling continuously from a reel of thread that is concealed in their mouths. As they pull on the thread, it falls upon the face and body of the figure. In the transient nature of the material, the web appears both strong and frail. Clark wrote, my communication is such a biological, cellular experience that it is only communicable through an organic and cellular manner, from one to two to t three or more, but something always comes out of the other, and it is an extremely intimate communication, from pore to pore, hair to hair, from sweat to sweat. The threads are coated with saliva, and in the act of regurgitation, parches the participants' mouths, and then produces copious amounts of saliva. A hot, sticky thread clings like a cobweb that slowly forms a multicoloured, crystalline cocoon that smothers and protects the body. Patches of hot and cool tones present a subjective map of the body. Red face, yellow and purple feet. After the thread is cast, the group lay their hands over the shrouded figure and begins randomly to remove tufts of cotton. This group action is heavily symbolic. Brecht discusses the chain of metaphors, which unravels in Bubba. The cotton thread as saliva is drawn from the interior of the body, stands for the viscera as a symbol of psychic being, the thread as a kind of lifeline. The mouth represents a transitional space, interior but also able to expel air and voice into the space outside of the body. This pulling up of the innards brings about a catharsis of our very being, the very being of the individual who is the participant, is in an open and yet seemingly vulnerable position. That vulnerability can be compared to the feeling of a hair at the back of a mouth, an intrusion, a foreign article that is in the wrong place. Here, the body reacts in very different ways to thought. Its natural instinct is to repel the intrusion <coughs> with a spontaneous gagging or coughing action. For the one being drooled upon, I take a quote from Sueli Holnik, a Brazilian psychoanalyst and someone who studied Clark's work extensively. She experienced Bubba and said, the blindfold is taken off, returned to the visible world. In the flux of entangled drool, a new body, a new face, a new self was molded. Clark describes the phenomenon created by the group. We arrived at what I call corpo collettivo, collective body, which is the exchange between people of their intimate psychology. This exchange is not necessarily a pleasant thing. The idea that a person vomits life experience when taking part in a proposition. This vomit is going to be consumed by others who will also vomit their inner contents. It is therefore an exchange of psychic qualities and the word communication is too weak to express what happens in the group. It is true that Clark developed an aversion to s performance art or at least to the acts that turn performance into ritual apropos of voice. But despite this aversion, 
her agency as therapist was performative by the nature of her physicality. More importantly, it improvised responses to her subject's own theatre. Within that theatre, the relational objects become props to act and act out with. Moreover, it is difficult not to consider her Copacabana practice as an arena for the ritualistic. <coughs> the immersive, sanctified space of the practice afforded the subject the security to engage fully with the conceptual and physical nature of Clark's psychotherapeutic and psychosomatic healing. Clark's approach differed greatly from the non-tactile, standard analytic encounter, but offered, a therapeutic, but offered a therapeutic practice that could double as a space of physical theatre for clients to recall and live out their fantasies and traumas. The works of Clark, Oitacica, and other Brazilian artists of this period do not represent an overt political commentary of Brazil's situation. Rather, their approach reflects an indirect, micro-political, and experiential response to the body as a biological and architectural construct. The inescapable house of memory, feeling, and af affect that we carry with us. Thank you.